Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you. Hello and welcome to Self Inflicted Aural Nostalgia, the Guided by Voices podcast, every GBVLP, every two weeks. My name is Jeff Gomez, and today we're looking at the surprise return of GBV, the 2016 record, Please Be Honest. But first, as usual, all music heard in this podcast is played and owned by Guided by Voices. Any reviews or materials cited are owned by their respective creators. And of course, many thanks goes out to Jeff Warren's Guided by Voices database, which you really should visit at gbvdb.com. Go to my site, everygbvlp.com, to subscribe to future episodes or listen to past episodes of this podcast. And drop me a line with corrections, suggestions, or thoughts at jeff at everygbvlp.com. I'd also like to announce that when the series wraps up in December after the Space Gun episode, I'm going to be releasing a free digital LP. It's a tribute compilation entitled How Do You Spell GBV that'll feature over two dozen bands and musicians with each contributing an original song about or inspired by Guided by Voices. And in the weeks leading up to the compilation's release, I'll be premiering one song in each of the next four episodes. So stay tuned at the end of this episode to hear the world premiere of Suitcase by No Museums. It's an absolutely stellar track, and I really think you're going to like it. I'll also be asking for people to send me footage of their GBV collections and memorabilia for a video for another one of the songs in the compilation. So check for more information about that on Tuesday on the Self-Inflicted Aerial Nostalgia Facebook page. Now let's get to the show. Orbital Ghost Attracts all right, we're now beginning our countdown of the last four LPs in the series by looking at 2016's sort of surprise return of GBV. It was a surprise because Bob shit canned the band and the name Guided by Voices. Back in 2014, while they still had a dozen dates left on the Cool Planet tour, Bob felt it had run its course, so he pulled the plug. That being said, there was no definitive announcement about the fate of Guided by Voices, unlike back in 2004 when Bob boldly declared, This is it for GBV. Instead, the group or the general idea of the band was left kind of open-ended. There was no firm position that the group was through once and for all. And yet Bob also didn't tease any new releases or lineups as Guided by Voices. Instead, he went and did what he does best and spent 2015 making and releasing records, some of which were his new bands. In just that one year, Pollard put out a solo LP, the very fine Faulty Superheroes, as well as the Circus Devils album Stomping Grounds, along with three, count them, three full-length LPs for his new side project, Ricked Wiki. Or rather, since GBV was no more, that was sort of looking to be his new main band. I'll talk more about Rickard Wiki later, but something to note here is that Bob's 2015 solo record was the last one he'd make with longtime collaborator Todd Tobias. They would go on to work on just one more Circus Devils record, 2017's Laughs Last, and since then, Bob hasn't worked with Todd. This is a pretty big deal since Tobias had been heavily involved in Bob's projects for a decade by this point, working on dozens of Pollard's albums and hundreds of songs, and pretty much always the results were spectacular. Like, listen to just a bit of In a Circle from Lord of the Birdcage. We stand in a circle. We move in a circle. Time to move it and ground psychological bow. Hands down in routine exercise. In inconstant reverie. In makeshift. It's such an amazing song, with Tobias adding so much in terms of his production and playing. And by the way, I love it when Pollard sings in the track of Nine O'Clock Meetings. It shows that even though he'd quit his day job almost 20 years before, he still remembered the routine tedium of white-collar existence. John Lennon may have sung about being a working-class hero, but for my money, Bob's the real thing. So the fact that Pollard had shed such an important collaborator seems like big news, almost on the same level as breaking up the band or no longer working with Tobin Sprout. And while his new collaborator, Nick Mitchell, was proving capable enough, and I'll talk more about this later, Tobias was leaving some pretty big shoes to fill. Another thing that happened in 2015 was that the fourth volume of the Suitcase series was released, this one entitled Captain Kangaroo Won the War. 
And since this was an archival release and not a new GBV album, I personally thought the name might not ever get used again. And if so, then Suitcase 4 would be the last thing, other than maybe a live record or some other kind of compilation, to be released as Guided by Voices. But then, in 2016, Pollard announced that not only was he releasing a new GBV record, but that he played all the instruments on the album. Not only were Mitch Mitchell and Greg Demos no longer in the group, but it seemed neither was anyone else. This not only took people by surprise, it raised eyebrows as well. It was sort of like Paul McCartney calling Ram a Beatles record. Pitchfork greeted this news by proclaiming that Guided by Voices are back. Sort of. Confusing matters even more is that the GBB album came out just a month after Pollard's latest solo record, Of Course You Are, prompting Spin to write, which would seem to make Please Be Honest a solo record as well. So then, why was one LP a solo record and the other a GBV album? Theories abounded online, with Stereogum surmising, maybe he's reviving the name because the new songs fit the GBV tradition, or maybe he realizes that people care more when his old band's name is attached. Pollard's admitted in the past that stuff that's released as GBV just sells more and gets more attention, so there's probably something to the theory. Basically, what happened was is that Bob had a batch of songs that he liked, and he resolved to record them by playing everything himself. It's something he'd done before, with GBV around the time of Vampire and Titus, as well as with a couple of his side projects and solo records. But this time, as he says, I came up with the notion that if I could pull it off and it wasn't too clunky, I'd record it under the name Guided by Voices, which is really the flagship for all my projects. If not, I was going to call it Teenage Guitar. There are two things here that I find really interesting. The first is that he acknowledges that GBV has become a brand. It's no longer just a product, it's a way of life. And in a Frankenstein's monster kind of way, it's become bigger even than Bob, the man who brought it into the world. Because while Pollard doesn't need band members for music to be GBV, as he showed on the next record, Double LP August by Cake, GBV doesn't even need him. After all, what makes Sudden Fiction or High Five Hall of Famers GBV songs, except that's what they're released or labeled as? The same goes for years of Tobin Sprout songs. What was the difference between a song Toby released as GBV versus on one of his solo records? Sometimes Sprout would even release the same song in a GBV version and a solo version, as is the case with It's Like Soul, Man. What made something guided by voices because that's what it said on the sleeve? The second thing that's interesting in Pollard's statement is that he sort of admits that his previous work as Teenage Guitar was clunky. I'm not at all a fan of those records, and it's simultaneously refreshing and frustrating to have Bob state that those LPs aren't of a high quality. It shows that he does have standards, that he can tell good work from bad. Please Be Honest was recorded at his new favorite location, Cybertechnics, in Dayton. He worked with studio owner and engineer Phil Mahaffey to set up various stations around the studio with different instruments, and Pollard would just move from station to station, playing whatever was needed. Another thing that was interesting is that the LP was recorded in sequence, completing and mixing usually one song a day. In some cases, Paul had recorded three songs in a day. The LP was done in seven days, at which point, as Bob says, I thought it worked and sounded like a GBV album, so that's what it is. And while plenty of people and publications were skeptical about the LP, plenty were also won over but was actually a pretty solid record. As the AV Club wrote, it's understandable to be a bit suspicious here, as this could be just an excuse for Pollard to release an album under the Guided by Voices moniker and attain more publicity in the process. But after listening to the album, it's hard not to agree with him. This album has all the elements of old school GBV. They even gave the LP a B plus, a full grade higher than Motivational Jumpsuit. Pop Matters agreed with that general sentiment, writing that, regardless of lineup, GBV does have an aesthetic they stick to pretty closely. However, by giving the album a 4 out of 10, the website showed that it didn't think much of the aesthetic. The review ends with, If you're deeply invested in the Guided by Voices catalog, this record won't disappoint you. You're getting exactly what they're selling. If there's not much to the album past that point, well, that doesn't have to matter so terribly. Pitchfork also wasn't buying it, calling the record a decidedly mixed bag. Of course, what's ironic about this is that pretty much every GBV album is at a decidedly mixed bag. It's just that some of the bags are better than others. Pitchfork goes on to write that, with its slapdash lo-fi production and jarring transitions from ballad to rocker to quirky one-off, 
Please Be Honest is as close a sonic relative of GBV's post-2010 discography, Let's Go Eat the Factory in particular. But this new Pollard-only GBV has less of the easygoing melodicism and sense of goofy fun that kept those records fresh, even at their most awkward moments. Consequence of Sound, in a review that sounded like a summation of Bob's whole career, gave the LP a C+, deciding that, taken on its own, it's a fine if not slightly disappointing work. Speaking of the GBV aesthetic, the cover and packaging look really great, sporting a Pollard collage set against a black background. It's only the second cover after Class Clown spots a UFO to feature a large black border or background. The collage that Pollard chose to be part of the cover is also pretty interesting. The majority of the image is taken up with a black and white photograph of the inside of a prison. A huge door is open and, at the opening to a cluster of cells, stands a solitary figure, a man. At the end of this passageway is the rune, GBV's quasi-logo. This could be read as a statement on both the solo nature of the record, Bob as a one-man band, as well as, since it was becoming obvious that the legacy of Guided by Voices was something he was just never going to escape, that Pollard was about to enter, well, prison. GBV had not only become an albatross around his neck, but he was now thinking of the band as a literal jail cell, and one that he was willingly placing himself inside of. A color insert above the prison photo shows a bunch of businessmen. Two of them in the foreground are shaking hands. It's a kind of schmoozy, glad-handing and deal-making that Pink Floyd was satirizing with their cover for Wish You Were Here, where one of the guys shaking hands is on fire. Was Pollard similarly commenting on the decision or deal he'd made when he revived GBV? Was bringing back the band just a cynical business transaction? Did Bob feel conflicted or at very least ambivalent about what he was doing? A photo of shopping carts in the inside sleeve is another acknowledgement that GBV was now just another product, something to be bought and paid for, the same as toothpaste. And while it was all well and good to have a new record by whatever the hell Guided by Voices now was, an even better sign that Pollard was going to revive GBV in a major way came when he announced live dates to support Please Be Honest. He ended up playing dozens of shows and touring more than half a year from April, when the record came out, to December. And while he may have played all the instruments on the LP by himself, for the subsequent tour he put together his usual and preferred five-piece band setup, two guitars, bass, drum, and him on vocals. On bass, he drafted in Mark Shu. Shu, who's originally from Virginia but now lives in Brooklyn, was a veteran of the band The Library Is On Fire. That band was founded by Ohio native Steve Five in 2008. And in a delicious act of foreshadowing, Mark and Steve met at a Robert Pollard art opening in New York. Also, the band's first LP was actually recorded by longtime Pollard collaborator Todd Tobias at Waterloo Sound back in Ohio. Tobias and Five got along so well, they started a group together called Brother Earth. For the 2010 Library is on Fire LP, Magic Windows, Magic Nights, about half the tracks were recorded on a Tascam Porta 1, the same model GBV used on a bunch of their early 90s work. The Library on Fire is a good band, and with Steve Five's penchant for using Pollard-esque collages on their record sleeves, you can see how they were fans of GBV. That being said, they're a bit heavier and sludgier than GBV, sounding more like a vintage touch-and-go or sub-pop band than Guided by Voices. But the fact that Shu contributed songs to the group and had started off playing guitar meant that he was a great addition to the new GBV lineup. He would also end up being the youngest guy in the group, being nearly half Bob's age, something which Pollard seems to delight in pointing out on while on stage. Another new member was Bobby Bear Jr. Describing himself as a huge, obsessive Guided by Voices fan, he first saw the group live in 1997 when they were on the bill with Nashville Pussy. Bear's father is a country music singer and songwriter who's had a long career which includes a number of hits on the country and pop charts in the 60s and 70s. Bear Jr., when he was just eight years old, even joined his dad on one of his biggest songs, the Grammy-nominated What If. It was written by Bear Sr.'s friend Shel Silverstein, the author of a number of children's classics, including Where the Sidewalk Ends. The song is a super sweet and touching discussion between a father and son, the younger asking the older a series of what-if questions, such as, what if the sun stopped shining? It's a great conceit since, as anyone with young kids knows, they never tire of asking questions. And while it's a fun and good-natured song, the climax is devastating when the son asks, what if I stopped loving you? What would happen then? And the father answers that it would be the end of his world. 
In its own subversive way, it's just as emotional and effective a song as Father and Son by Cat Stevens or Harry Chapin's Cats in the Cradle. Two other songs I can never get through without bursting into tears. Bear Sr. continues to play shows and release music. His most recent record, Things Change, was released this year in 2018. In fact, one of the tracks which Bear Sr. made for a video entitled I Drink could pretty much be a GBV song. It channels both drinker's peace and how's my drinking, with Bear Sr. crooning after saying that, well, he drinks, I know what I am, but I don't give a damn. Because Bear Jr. was surrounded by his dad's music, not to mention was part of show business at such an early age, he was also on Hee Haw as a kid, it's pretty natural that he, too, would become a musician and songwriter. And whether solo, recording under his own name, or with his band, Young Criminals Starvation League, he's released half a dozen records, starting in 1998 with Boutte. He was even, in 2015, the subject of a full-length documentary entitled Don't Follow Me, I'm Lost. Born in 1966, he now has three kids of his own, including a son and daughter from his first marriage to Megan Young. Young was also country music royalty, being the daughter of Chip Young, a renowned Nashville session player who recorded with everyone from Willie Nelson to My Morning Jacket. Young was also part of the infamous Elvis Presley Jungle Room sessions at Graceland, and he plays on the track Way Down, which ended up being the last single released before the iconic singer's untimely death at the age of just 42. Bear Jr. and Young subsequently divorced, and Bear Jr. now has another son with his girlfriend. Bear Jr.'s band opened for GBV on the Cool Planet tour, and once the tour ended, he began hanging out with Pollard and his wife. In terms of joining GBV, Bear Jr. says, I cried when he asked me. When questioned about the pressures of being in the band and perhaps getting on Bob's bad side, he answered, Oh yeah, he's been known to fire the whole band for whatever, so I'm doing everything I can to be the best version of a guitar player in Guided by Voices I possibly can. Because I love this stuff so much, and I love him so much, and I'm so excited that I get to do this, it blows my mind. In addition to new guys Bear Jr. and Mark Shue, Bob brought back Kevin March on drums. Remember that March had replaced Kevin Fennell after he was booted from the band after the Motivational Jumpsuit LP. Not to mention that March had also played on the last two GBV records in the second Matador era, Earthquake Glue and Half Smiles of the Decomposed. Plus, he'd played on all three of the Ricked Wiki records from the year before, so asking him to rejoin a rejuvenated GBV made perfect sense. He's also just a really great drummer and, as we'd find out on August by Cake, a talented singer and songwriter in his own right. Another holdover from the Rick and Wiki project was guitarist Nick Mitchell, who'd played guitar in the 2015 side project, as well as contributed songs. Mitchell had also played all the instruments and produced Pollard's most recent solo record around this time, Of Course You Are, taking over those duties from longtime collaborator Todd Tobias. Mitchell's a Dayton local and, it should be pointed out, is not related to former GBV guitarist Mitch Mitchell. He was described by no less than Don Thrasher, former GBV drummer, in an article for the Dayton Daily News as a human jukebox with a repertoire of more than 1,000 cover songs. He's also, according to Thrasher, a talented songwriter, musician, and audio engineer with his own home recording studio. For over two decades, he's played in a band called Skeptical Cats. Website Dayton.com described the group as one of the longest running and most established bands in the Midwest. He's also similar to Pollard in that he has two kids, has done some teaching, and for years, he had a day job while trying to write songs and play shows in his free time. Once he quit his job, he played, and continues to play, at pubs and bars all around Dayton. In fact, for over a decade now, he's played over 300 shows a year. Performing so much and covering a large number of bands as part of his act means that he's a talented and versatile guitarist. Paula described Mitchell to Premier Guitar Magazine as a really good player, adding that he can play almost any song. Bob went as so far as to compare him to longtime sideman Doug Gillard. And above just technical proficiency, the two seem to have a lot in common, Mitchell telling Thrasher that we can talk for hours about bands, labels, and stuff like that. And since Nick and Bob had made four records together, inviting him to join Guided by Voices just seemed to make sense. He was even described in one article about the Please Be Honest lineup as being on the verge of becoming Pollard's go-to guy for just about anything. It makes sense since he was a triple threat. He was Doug Gillard wrapped inside of Todd Tobias with, since he wrote and sang his own songs on Pollard's records, a pinch of Tobin Sprout. However, about halfway through the tour, after a show at the Grog Shop in Cleveland that got cut short, 
The band never emerged for an encore. Mitchell was asked to leave the band and the tour. It's a pretty stunning turn of events for a guy who was well on his way to becoming part of Bob's trusted inner circle. But Mitchell, in the interview with Thrasher quoted above, was not only pragmatic about his future, he was also wary, perhaps knowing the same as Bear Jr., the history of Pollard and band members. He said, I have no illusions it's going to go on forever, and I've told them that. No one guy, one band, or one group of guys could ever totally facilitate Bob's muse, but I'm honored as hell to be working with him. So Mitchell was out, and while the band would soon have a month before their next show, the very next day they were booked to play a festival in Cincinnati. But they were down a guitar player. What could they do? Would they cancel? Play as a four-piece? What Bob did is turn to the guy he'd compared Mitchell to, Doug Gillard. Bringing Doug back into the band made perfect sense for pretty much every reason. He knew the songs, he'd been present for big chunks of the band's best work, and he'd been a great collaborator with Pollard on projects such as Lifeguard. And he as Bob had recently reunited for the ESP Ohio project, which put on a criminally underrated record the same year Please Be Honest was released. Gillard was also friendly with Mark Shu, having shared bills in New York with The Library is on Fire. Shu had also played in Doug's solo band. The only problem was that GBV was in Ohio and Gillard was in New York. Plus, when Bob initially reached out to him, Doug was asleep. As Gillard told the AV Club, I got calls and texts very late one night, but didn't see the messages until morning. But once Doug and Bob spoke, Gillard got onto a plane and made it to Ohio in time to learn a few new songs at the band's hotel. Gillard saved the day. GBV would not have to perform a freeform jazz exploration in front of a festival crowd. After the show, Pollard asked Gillard to rejoin the group and Doug accepted. He's been in the band ever since. This is the lineup who would go on to record at least five new GBV records, one of which would be a double album. It's an amazing group of guys, and their involvement with Bob has ushered in a new golden era for the band, christening what I'm calling the new classic lineup, something we'll talk about more in the next couple of episodes. But for now, let's take a look at the record that started it all, song by song. Please Be Honest kicks off with My Zodiac Companion. Orbital Ghost Attract Sparks Aftermath Heaven the unborn called they miss you the stones are dead hearing this for the first time i was a bit nervous i'd heard that pollard was playing all the instruments and since i wasn't a fan of the teenage guitar records which were let's remember released just a few years before we're not talking about stuff he'd done in the 90s i was not looking forward to the new guided by voices lp being basically a third teenage guitar album and pollard's vocal at the very beginning is a bit rough but the guitar sounds good and there's some synth and when the drums come crashing in about 30 seconds into the song it sounds really huge. In fact, the drumming late in the track doesn't sound too bad. It's actually a good song and a good way to start the album. It's also one of the tracks from the record that ended up sounding absolutely massive live. When those drums kick in and Kevin March just attacks them and with the double guitars and bass it's really awesome. Something interesting I learned from my conversation with filmmaker Mike Postalakis is that he almost made a video for the track. It would have featured a couple seen via split screen on the last day of their relationship. Chloe Savigny would have played one half of the couple, but when the guy who was asked to play the other half balked at appearing, the video was scrapped. Which is too bad since it's a good and evocative song, plus it probably would have helped in terms of exposure for the LP. And finally, if you believe in things like Zodiac Companions, go to website astrologycompanion.com to discover your true love match. Second song is Kid on a Ladder. Kid on a Ladder Letting sunlight in his fall You might know This is a super fun song built around a drum machine loop. That fact alone makes me happy, since the picture of Pollard, this classic rock guy with an aversion to technology, sitting around and programming beats on a drum machine is just too fun. And it's a good track with some distorted guitar and a loping bass line. It doesn't hew to any sort of structure, there's no discernible chorus, it's just Bob singing verses throughout. But it sounds really good. It's a great example of Bob creating vocal melodies on top of chord structures. In terms of what those lyrics actually mean, website pretty much amazing wrote of Kid Ladder. Is it about our current state of affairs? The choices faced by today's youth? Maybe. I'm not sure deciphering Pollard's beguiling avant-garde poetry speaks to how beautiful it often is. 
I agree with that. The song doesn't necessarily convey anything to me intellectually, but it's nice to listen to, and that's enough. Third song on the first side is Come On, Mr. Christian. Come on, Mr. Christian, hand me the jug. I won't take the boot for a coward salute. Not gonna weep now. The instrumentation of this slower song is pretty interesting. The electric guitar is playing single notes rather than chords, and Bob's actually playing a beat on the drums and doing some fills. There's also some keyboard synth. So he's really trying to give the songs color, and for the most part, he succeeds. The song also has a nice outro with some found sound. I don't know if it's Pollard speaking or a clip from a movie, but it's slowed down and sounds sort of trippy, like John Lennon saying cranberry sauce at the end of Strawberry Fields Forever. In terms of the lyrics, my guess is that the song's about mutiny on the bounty, with Pollard singing from Captain Bly's point of view and addressing the man leading the mutiny, Fletcher Christian. The references to drinking from a jug and a coward's salute seem to reinforce this, not to mention the pun that Bob would be making in the final line by employing the phrase shape up or ship out. The original novel and subsequent film versions of Mutiny on the Bounty were based on actual events that occurred in 1789. A popular movie with Marlon Brando as Christian came out in 1962, so I can imagine Bob seeing it on TV when he was a kid. Moving on, it's The Grasshopper Eaters. For me, the record comes to a complete standstill with this tuneless track that's pretty annoying. Not helping matters is that it's the record's longest song in about three and a half minutes. It just seems to go on and on. There's some decent acoustic guitar phrases in the songs, but pretty much everything is obscured if not just plain drowned out by what sounds like a plumber working on the studio's toilet, while Bob just howls nonsense in the background. It's Pollitt at his most bewildering and, for me, frustrating. However, online zine Treble liked the song, calling it a highlight, which manages to marry the classic lo-fi aesthetic with one of those great Pollard melodies. So, there you go. And for the record, in plenty of cultures and countries around the world, people do eat grasshoppers. One writer who wrote an article for NPR called, So What Does a Deep Fried Grasshopper Taste Like? described it as, a bit like a crunchy prawn eaten with its shell. And according to an article in Wired magazine, eating grasshoppers may become more prevalent. Why? Well, insects are packed with protein, much less damaging to the environment than other livestock, and can even be killed humanely by popping them in the freezer. So basically, we'll all be grasshopper eaters one day. The next track is Glittering Parliaments. The record gets back on track with this fun, fast-paced song, and for me, it's the one that sounds the most GBV. Because while I like Kid on a Ladder, that really feels more like a Pollard solo track than anything I've heard on a Guided by Voices album. Whereas this one has a flow and feeling, with a discernible bass line and guitar that howls feedback, as well as a steady backbeat. It's one of the most strong songs in the LP, and if the record had gone from Come On Mr. Christian right to this track, that would have been a really nice flow. The lyrics are Pollard at his most surreal, with one of the verses being, Illustration Museum, Let Us Cry From a Window. Paragoric sop, heavy clods at hole one, Apollonian bronze foil. The title doesn't seem to refer back to anything in the lyrics, but the vocals are mixed to the same level with the guitar, so they really become just another instrument. When he sings the refrain of Sinners and Wanderers, Quite Chosen, which is the closest thing the song has to a chorus, it sounds really good. Side one begins to wrap up with The Caterpillar Workforce. Hell, hell, but We had grasshoppers two songs ago, and now we have caterpillars. Not that the song seems to be about insects or bugs, although bookworms get a shout out. The song's okay, with some nice guitars and droney organ, but there's not much to it. It's barely a minute and a half long, and it feels very much like a sketch. It doesn't at all feel like a complete song, which is a shame since there's nice touches in it that I would really love to have seen fleshed out. 
like when Pollard sings 40 Seconds In at Ichabod Wood over a chiming acoustic guitar. It's really nice. But as soon as that moment arrives, it disappears and it's on to the next song. By the way, Ichabod Wood is probably not a place, but a person's name. The website findagrave.com lists an Ichabod Wood from New York who died in 1817 and another who lived in Massachusetts who died in 1798. Ichabod, while have recently fallen out of favor as a first name, must have been more common in the 19th and 18th centuries. Remember that the protagonist of Washington Irving's The Legend of Sleepy Hollow was named Ichabod Crane. Second to last song on side one is Sad Baby Eyes. In the gloomy palace Sad baby eyes Sad baby eyes In a horror of the eyes This is the album's shortest song at just 35 seconds. It was, however, originally part of a much longer song suite called Peep Soul. Pollard intended this to be a sequel to both his 2004 song Windows of My World and one of the last songs on B-1000, Peep Hole. This ambitious track, which Bob had been tinkering with on and off since the 80s, would have traced the life of a woman named Annabelle Gin Blossom Cartwheel, a spiritual sister to the spinster we met in The Best of Jill Hives. Peep Soul would have given the listener a view into her existence, showing us pivotal moments of her life as she experienced them through the portals of her eyes. Pollard had sketched out four more songs to go with this idea, among them Curious Teenage Iris and AARP Retina Blues. At least one of those tracks had been considered for all three of the second round of Matador albums, but would always cut in the last minute. Bob tried these songs again for the reunion records, but could never get the sound right. He ultimately scrapped the Peep Soul idea and has so far released just this track, Sad Baby Eyes, which would have been the first song in the suite, introducing us to the Annabelle Cartwell character just after she was born. Actually, I'm fucking with you. I have no idea what's going on with that track or what led to it, except that Bob had a beer and someone pressed record and afterward they all said, hey, let's put that on the album. Last song on side one is The Quickers Arrive. This bare song, it's mostly just Bob and an electric guitar, is another one of the longer tracks on the record. Late in the song there's some other guitar parts including some bass that sounds almost like Joy Division, but it's not enough to, for me anyway, keep this from feeling like a sketch or a demo. The AB Club actually called this the record's strongest track, writing that even though we don't quite know who the Quickers are, the song creates a vibe of impending fear adding that. It feels as though the Quickers are not literal monsters, but our own fears and anxieties. That sort of gets back to the idea of fantasy creeps found in an earlier GBB song, those hopes and dreams of ours who hound us and won't let us alone. I also think that Quickers could be a Polaridian twist on the religious sect, the Quakers, who already got a shout out in the earlier song, The Grasshopper Eaters, Bob writing, decent Quakers walked there. That would fit with some of the other 18th and 17th century references sprinkled throughout the record, in addition to the other religious imagery that also crops up. Please Be Honest mentions a priest, there's praying in The Fetist's Lament, and my Zodiac companion name checks Magdalene, which might be a reference to Jesus' disciple Mary Magdalene. That being said, since Quakers are teetotalers, I doubt Pollard's looking forward to their arrival anytime soon. Side 2 kicks off with Hotel X. Big soap. Devouring frightful birds through quick when hops on me, page five. And then imagine the tomb, awkward selectors for the women and children. The song starts as a three chord stomper that you can imagine in a full band scenario, sounding like a slower planet score. The bass line also reminds me of Lethargy off of Propeller. At a minute and a half in, the song changes and gets a bit more acoustic. When Pollard sings, the trees outside are heavy with acorns, naked swimmers faking sleep, it sounds pretty good, except Bob's playing is pretty sloppy, making this sound more like something destined for a suitcase compilation. Pitchfork wrote of the track, and while musicianship is never the point with GBV, many of these tunes, like the lurching, proggy Hotel X Big Soap, would have benefited from a bit more finesse. Too many of the drum and guitar tracks sound like they're being played with a hammer. 
The song ends with a snippet of a marching band, which the liner notes credit to the Vandercook Lake Senior High School Band under the direction of Arnold Kumaro. The school is actually in Michigan, and Kumaro was the band director there for a long time, starting in 1968. He retired only a few years ago, in 2012, at the age of 67. Second song on side two is I Think a Telescope. I think a telescope, I think that nobody leaves. I think of how very old, I think I'll never be told. I think in time I will see, I think by clutching a nose. I think I'll probably go climb an invisible tree and then I'll know. This is a really nice track that's one of the most successful on the record. It's just Bob singing against some guitars, but it sounds really nice. There's even a solo towards the end that shows that Bob can get by okay without Doug Gillard. Also, if you listen closely with headphones, you can hear the click track or a metronome in the background. Third song on the second side is the album's title track, Please Be Honest. This is another one of the record's best tracks, with Pollard really hitting that Vampire and Titus propeller vibe. His singing sounds good, it sounds full with guitar and drums, and unlike a lot of the other songs in the LP, it doesn't sound like a sketch or a demo. Pitchfork said this song possessed the record's finest melody. Pitchfork also praised this song for its seeming lyrical clarity, adding that, refreshingly, the song touches on a real-world subject, Pollard's attempt to get someone to level with him rather than the usual carnival of GBV absurdities, the cucumber guns, shriveled artichokes, and glittering parliaments that populate the rest of the album. The next track is Nightmare Jamboree. Spectators This is another marginal song that doesn't do much for me, and it's kind of amazing this is recorded in a studio since it doesn't sound very good. Anybody singing into a cheap laptop using the built-in microphone would sound a lot better than this. So I guess Bob wants it to sound this way. He figures this is the GBV aesthetic. And even though I love some of the lo-fi stuff, I always figured that the poor sound quality of some of those songs and records was the side effect of the process instead of the main attraction, which it seems to be here. Either way, there's nothing coherent enough here in the lyrics or the melody to make me enjoy this song. The record begins to wind up with Unfinished Business. The drum machine is back on this short song, which Bob seems to be making some sort of comment about his artistic process. And this also gets to what I find so fascinating about Pollard, because as a guy with more than 100 full-length LPs under his belt and no sign of slowing down, he's not someone you'd expect to have any unfinished business. And yet a whole lot of the songs in those records were recorded in a way that made them feel or seem unfinished, like basically half the tracks on this LP. And this gets back to the first part of the argument I made when talking about Bob's prolific nature, that he views songwriting as an athletic versus an artistic pursuit. As he writes in this song, I won't know all the words, but I'll finish what I started. What's important isn't necessarily the finished product or the process. It's a matter of just getting out there and doing it. And if you lose, you'll be singing this next song. It's Defeatist's Lament. Can we live without nets? In the empire of the bottle Shall we not sink From the efforts of In this spare song of just acoustic guitar and piano, Pollard's here reminiscing a bit about his jock past, writing about no more shots in the arm and no more comebacks. Remember that Bob was a star pitcher and his dad used to massage his arm after games. And using the sporting analogy I talked about in the last song, Bob seems to be saying that you lose if you don't even try. That's the lament of the defeatist. If your attitude is, well, we're going to lose, then you've already lost. Whereas Bob sees glory in merely participating and getting out there and giving it your all. Final song in the album is I Shop Heaven. I 
eyes fall to the snails, and nails, flattening dress the street of swollen legs. This song takes a while to get going, but when it finally does, it's pretty good. Spill Magazine wrote of this track, I Shop Heaven sounds like what might have happened if Soundgarden had merged with a 1960s pop group. The growling lyrical verses accented by an amped up lead guitar are contrasted by choruses that focus in on drums, melody, and a more rhythmic guitar line. I agree that it's one of the better songs on the record, and it's a good way to end the LP. Okay, that's it for the show. In two weeks, we'll be looking at GBV's 23rd record, the Mammoth Double LP August by Cake, which, for some reason, was actually released in April. Go figure. But first, I'd like to now showcase one of the tracks that's going to be on the free Guided by Voices tribute LP, How Do You Spell GBV, which will come out in December. This is Suitcase by No Museums. See you in two weeks. Drinking in Northridge, the Midwestern.